Um, we've got a bit of an interesting session today, so I really want to run everyone through the format. Uh, it's meant to be a participatory session, so there's things on your table that you can use to participate. Um, the model that we're using, the whole purpose of this day is to create a document at the end. It may not be today, but it might be in a month from now. It may be a living document that gets created over time. And I'm using the model of creating a recipe, a recipe for data publishing methods. In fact, effective recipes for data publishing methods. So there's a bit of a model to it. You have the name of the recipe. Each of you have got, uh, on your tables, you have some web sheets and you've got some textures. Uh, there's a bit of theatre to all this, so the textures are multicoloured and that's, that's to represent that uh, everyone has their own unique context. And the purpose here is for you to consider the speakers and as they're presenting their ideas, uh, talking about what they've done and what they've learned, try and contextualise that for yourself. It's like a form of active listening where you try and repeat back to yourself what, what that person's saying in your own context. So, first thing is you, you literally will, if you feel so inclined, write down the name of your recipe. It could be where you're at within your own jurisdiction, your own public program. You might be thinking, what's the next thing I have to do? Um, there's lots of sheets, so you can do more than one, that's for sure. The kinds of things that you might have in your recipes, the kinds of things you might be trying to make, um, I'll go through it a little bit later and that, that'll make more sense. So, um, what you will need. So, for this purpose, uh, this, work, this workshop, I'm basically running through a recipe type approach. It's, it's the name is, the published data cookbook. What you need is basically to be at the conference and to have your worksheet in front of you. The ingredients for today are our speakers, Neil Phantom from the World Bank, Sarah Bird from Activate. We've got David Reed from the US government, Mark Head from Axella, and we've got Ashley Casavan from the Canadian government. I'll let them all introduce themselves when they come up to speak and actually talk about what they do, whether they've got job titles, all that kind of stuff. But there are ingredients, our methods. So what we're gonna to do today is listen to short presentations. We're going to have a short panel Q&A pretty much after each presentation. Um, the idea is that people, as we're going, make their own recipes. You don't have to do it today, you can go away and work on them later. Um, and then the, ho the whole idea is that we want to collect these recipes. So at the bottom of the sheets, there's an email address where you can um, contact me. You don't have to use the worksheet, scan it, or anything like that. You can literally just write down, here are my ingredients, here's my title, here's my um, things I need, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then at the end of the sheet, uh, we want to talk about what these recipes are good for. The context there is, well, uh, you might make a meal for your home family. That's, that's a different context to a meal for entertaining guests or a massive buffet for a lunchtime session at an international conference. So the things that we're cooking for, what's the context and what's it really good for? So just to recap, on the worksheets we have a recipe name, what you'll need, ingredients. Those two are the ones that sort of uh, more, it's a bit more difficult to differentiate what I mean by those two, so I'll get onto that in a second. The method, the approach that's taken to cook the recipe, and what it's good for. So, there's one other thing on the back of the forms, because it goes on the other side, is take note. And that could be a take note as a helpful tip, or it could be a, a friendly warning, what not to do, what, what someone else is learning just kind of come, come at you and you think, well, I'll, I'll make sure I don't do that in my particular project, in my particular recipe. Uh, a couple of take notes for our session today. Data publishing uh, can be seen in different contexts. It can be seen as a technical endeavour. Um, it can be seen as a process and governance endeavour. It depends on where you are and what you do. So I've used this graphic here from uh, Rufus Pollock where he's created two axes to talk about open data IT on one axis and then other factors, things like institutions, governance and change. And obviously within those two axes, the spectrum of the type of program that you're involved in um, is very important as well. So whether you're doing open data for social good, whether you're doing it for transparency, whether you're doing it for um, civic activism, all sorts of things. Um, don't think that you're th that one size fits all. That's why it's really important as you're listening to think about your own personal context. The speakers are important, but they're, they're not your fresh ideas. And that's the other bit of theatre for the room. So um, just this morning I went down to the local markets and I picked up some uh, fresh ingredients for today and you've got them on your tables. Um, feel free to enjoy them and uh, think about them as you're going and about your fresh ideas and how you're going to approach open data. Now, I want to 
quickly run through a bunch of slides. Um, these are the sorts of things uh, you might be considering. So this is my formal presentation now, so I'll start to talk about myself. I should ask, are there any questions about the format? Where's that fruit? I, no, <laughs> <laughs> I had that question before, and the answer is the fresh ideas are out here. Ah, yeah. <laughs> okay, I get it. Um, there's seats down the front, guys, if you want to come through. Otherwise, um, people get cranky because they don't want to share their fruit. Um, there's some over here. So, um, basically, one of, the, one of the recipes you might need is a business case. How do you endorse within your jurisdiction, within your government, within your project, within your gut, for your company? Um, the, one of the most effective ones that I've used in the past is uh, an economic argument. The, the key one that I use most often is basically uh, depreciation costs um, around scalability of resources, so economies of scale. Um, if you look up theory of the firm, if you look up transaction costs, you've got a question in each entity firm as to whether you do things internally or whether you partner with external parties and, and basically co-create something. Uh, an example is, would I outsource this? Well, I would outsource it if I have to, if I would, if, if I was to do it myself, set up an IT development firm, set up a, a governance body to do consulting within my uh, group of stakeholders, it would cost me a lot more than if I actually outsourced it. But there are other ways to think about collaboration. Uh, the long-term benefits of open data are all about reducing transaction costs. Um, there's also open data policy. So within a, your jurisdiction, if we're talking about government type work, you might need a recipe for getting your policy up. And that becomes a prerequisite. When I started to talk about the difference between what you'll need and ingredients, a recipe might be for creating an open data policy and then you'll start to talk about the ingredients such as I need you know, one full-time employee dedicated on this for the next three months, I'll need stakeholder consultation, I'll need this, this and this. And then we talk about the methods and that's how you move forward. Now, from a different recipe, you might find that the open data policy is actually a what you'll need. And you can see how you can build a hierarchy here. Things will cascade. Now, Another one is an open data management system. Um, we've actually been heavily stacked on the panel with people who prefer or use, uh, not to be too sort of, uh, or to try to be more agnostic, uh, CCAN. Uh, so that's the example that I'll just run through a little bit today. You'll want to create something if you're a government jurisdiction like a clearinghouse for open data. And this is the example that we've created, uh, my company's created with the uh, Australian government for their federal open data portal. You'll want to be able to educate your data custodians. So there's a training process, there's a, a, an ongoing education process. You'll need a recipe for that. The Australian government's opened up a uh, wiki to create the, the best practices, the actual step-by-step -step guide on how to become a data custodian, how to cleanse your data, how to be sure it's not containing personal information, all those types of things. You want to collaborate with your local technology community because, as I said in the economic argument, reducing transaction costs. If you want government and civic engagement, or if you want collaboration between NGOs, then you want to be able to engage those people through things like hackathons. So the example here is GovHack, which in Australia has grown from two locations to 30 locations between Australia and New Zealand in three years. This year we'll be running it with about, well, we've currently got about 2,000 registered hackers. And it's a really great way uh, to raise the um, engagement with communities. As a side note, um, hackathons, in my view, are for two things in, in the world of open data, <coughs> they work effectively for. One is to um, allow people to serendipitously connect with one another within their own technical niches, their own domain-specific niches. I'm a Python developer, I'm a UX person, I'm a, a humanities person who really understands the domains of libraries and archives and museums and galleries, for example. Um, and the, the second reason is to create a, a pool from government to actually release, release data sets. Uh, there's a really careful fine line that you have to tread there around government agencies and, and what you create as an expectation for them with their engagement with the program. You don't want them to think that they're going to get civic apps out of a hackathon and that they're going to actually be getting their economic benefit. You just want to be able to use the momentum of the hackathon to, to pool the data they, they need more long-term strategies around co-creation and collaboration real formal collaborative procurement processes to create the apps. Um, you want to be able to employ uh, an enterprise solution architecture. That might be a personal view based on my own context. 
But for an open data that, uh, program, a data management system, you want a long-term view. It's not just a catalog. What are all the various ingest methods? How big will it scale? Will it be enterprise grade so that the, the hacker community that I'm spending tens of thousands of dollars to engage with can build apps directly to it? Or are they going to treat it like an FTP server and just download and transform the data from there? You want to be able to partner with your network with stakeholders. So um, this is an example with my company, so I talk about myself a little bit, I guess, where we've looked at our, our value chain and our network map and what we use in terms of our compute, storage, and network suppliers. So we largely use Amazon. We look at software such as Drupal and Seacam and how they bundle together to create what we call a platform. We look at how we push that platform out, um, propagate it within uh, our various market segments. So we've got an international brand called Data Shades. But then we think about the, the, long, the long chain around consulting, uh, data curation, governance services within agencies, um, building things like that wiki that I mentioned earlier around custodian uh, education, and how we the various paths that you may run through in that whole network. So within your own programs, think about your network of supply, suppliers, your network of stakeholders. So my formal introduction is that basically I'm a director of a company called Link Digital, based in Canberra, Australia, uh, for the last 14 years. And I run the user group there for the Amazon folks. Um, I'm on the board of Open Knowledge Australia, which is a, a great organisation, Open Knowledge globally. I'm sure there's representatives here scattered throughout the whole conference and the room. And um, I'm one of the organisers for GovHack. Admittedly, this year I haven't had a lot of time to be involved, so there's a lot of really good people doing much more work than I. Um, I'm founder of Datashades, and I'm in the steering group for the CCAN Association. Um, I was at a uh, conference uh, for the CCAN Con, and there was a mention of eating your own dog food. When I talk about this stuff about collaboration, about co-creation, I think private companies have just as much a responsibility to engage with NGOs, with other organisations, as government does with citizens and private companies. So that's what we, we do. We, we donate as much as we can. Uh, I'll talk about a couple of case studies. Again, these are kind of recipes, um, presentations. Within uh, the, the Canberra city, uh, there's a bunch of destination marketing efforts to brand the city as CBR. And, um, as part of that, they released an innovation challenge uh, program where a couple of parties would come together and meet the challenge of the city. One was to create a whole of government video and image library. We, had, we tackled that with a data first approach, so we pulled together Amazon services, Drupal and Seacan. We built a public image and video library. It has a Drupal interface for common use cases, so users who might want to create their own galleries, their own collections of images. Also, local communities like an ornithologist group can collect pictures. Those interested interest in local flora and fauna can take pictures and geospatially collect them in there. Um, it has the CCAM portal as well, which is really important for the developer community. The, the city doesn't want to invest in a platform that just has a, a public facade that only fits one or, or many you know, few <coughs> use cases. They want a platform that can be built upon for any use case that anyone may have into the future. So CCAM, in this case, a data management system, um, provides that. And you can use other data management systems, you know, Juno, Bootcan, uh, Socrative platform, things like that. The, um, the architecture, if, if for want of a better word, uh, is basically a CCAN uh, data storm. There's data or image and video harvesting from Twitter and Flickr. So when we looked at this, we thought, well, there's already uh, a currency of video and image assets on the social internet. And we wanted to pull that in <coughs> to uh, create governance and provenance around that and make that a, uh, an asset for the city. Um, we've also got basically a public ingest method, that, that Drupal website. And we use some technology to make it cost effective over the long term. So the architecture behind it allows long term storage of data assets, video assets in particular, to be moved into Glacier, which is the low cost Amazon. It also uses um, Elastic Transcoder service to transcode high def um, video formats into consumable video formats. Another example is the Victorian um, Open Data Portal. Um, these guys are interesting because you know, they went through the steps. They created their information policy. Um, within their local context, they had jurisdictional concerns around, well, we're a whole of government entity, but we don't control the activity of the, our agencies. Um, and they will want to be able to have their own information management system. So we built 
basically a, a model. We identified their data. The classification of data is integral to is key uh, in the method to uh, developing any data management system that's going to be open. So the three classification points were there's internal data, and that's in particular for agent at the agency level. There's whole of government. If the agency is happy to share it with the whole of government, then it goes a step further. And then there's open. If it's free, free to use for anyone, then it goes out into the open data catalog. Uh, technically, to do that, we provided a, a matrix of sort of harvesting capability at the public level right at the top. Uh, it doesn't have any user interface. You don't go as a custodian through a UX to actually put data in there. Um, you could, but we just didn't model it that way. At the whole of government level, however, data custodians can go in through a user experience if their agency would like to do it that way. Or, below la a layer below that, um, the agency may want to set up its own instance of an information management system, whether it be TCAN or other, and then the whole of government instance will harvest from that. Through that segregation, you can have network level security, which may meets the needs of your um, uh, IT security management policies and things like that. So, at that final stage, when something might go from whole of government to public, uh, this is the sort of model that we adopted, um, the method we used. It's like a customs card. A lot of people might have come into the country from somewhere else. You have to declare whether or not you're um, carrying things that shouldn't be brought in. And the idea is everything must be marked no, no personal records, no confidential information, all that kind of stuff. If so, then it can go open. It puts some onus on the, uh, the data custodian to make those checks and balances come through. Collaboration. Now, collaboration is a essential part of the methodology in open data. But why is it important? It's important for innovation because you need multidisciplinary skills and experience to innovate. Uh, there's so much to know out there. No one division or group of people or individual could know it all. And certainly over time, if they're just focused on one thing, uh, with innovation occurring elsewhere, if they're not connected to that, they'll certainly lose track. Digital transactions, you really need stakeholder participation. There's a lot of talk around design thinking and user-centered design in government jurisdictions, so you need to be thinking about that. Data classification, again, collaboration is key. You need to engage with your stakeholders to do something like a data management system and classify data. Uh, and security, collaboration is important because you need peer review. So open source technology is great. It shines bright light on the source code. And um, being open and upfront about your security model, <coughs> data classification models is also key when you want to collaborate with stakeholders. It removes suspicion. Within Australia, we have a recently formed digital transformation office. So these are entities or offices like the government digital services in the UK, which start to think about and work on these intra-agency style. That's potentially a key ingredient or a prerequisite in my book for some certain types of uh, recipes you might want to cook up. Um, what is not good when it comes to open data? This, this is perhaps one of the takeaways. Um, this sort of PowerPoint presentation is a good example of how someone has created subjectively uh, a medium of communication, a medium of information with the intention that you guys all out there will then receive it and then within your own subjective point of view consume it and understand it. There's a lot of work there. There's a lot of context being created there. Um, and historically, we've been doing that for, you know, since the beginning of the information uh, age prior. And applications uh, as the cohort of uh, machines that need to connect to this information really can't break through. So what is best for open data is you need things like schemas, you need the data itself, and everything needs to be accessible via an API. Won't go too further into that, but there's a whole world there about making things more interoperable and more usable. That's it for me. I would ask some questions, but I guess the key question for me at this point would, at whether there's questions, I'd like to know if people, um, first of all, understand the format and understand if, if, if within their own personal context they can respond to this within their recipe books. Is that making sense? That's a yes, that's a tacit yes. yes. <laughs> Okay. Well, are there any questions? Just a general questions at this stage. Great. Well, in that case, I'd love to introduce my first speaker, the first speaker who will um, go through their experience. So that's Neil Fenton from World Bank. <coughs>